Energy stocks have been one of the few places to hide in this brutal bear market. <laughs> but with the Fed raising rates and a recession on the rise, is this as good as it gets? The fear of a recession on oil demand, I think, is vastly overstated. Even if the economy goes into uh, you know, a much, much more profound slowdown than I think most people are, are believing. We spoke with the Canadian energy icon himself, Eric Nuttall, to help us understand the correlations between recessions and demand destruction throughout history. And the answers may surprise you. So Eric, obviously a recession is, is one of the biggest concerns for energy investors right now. How much did demand fall during previous recessions like COVID-19 and the financial crisis? And could we expect a similar drop in demand now? Sure. It, it, it's a good question to lead off with because for energy investors, I think that's front and center. We don't have to worry really about supply because the supply challenges that we have are, are I think, well known and, and obvious. The, the more difficult to quantify risk is on demand. And we all suffer from recency bias. You know, COVID, biggest demand shock in history, demand fell by 8%. Prior to that was the great financial crisis of 2009 where demand fell by 2%. And so you look at, okay, prior recessions to that, it may be surprising, but demand actually didn't fall. The rate of growth fell, but there was still growth. And so we know that we're in an undersupplied market already, evidenced by falling inventories all around the world, despite the biggest release from the strategic petroleum reserves in history, combined with China, which has been suppressed by at least half a million barrels uh, per day due to COVID zero policies, which should be ending in the coming months. So what do recessions mean for oil? Usually it's a moderation in the rate of demand growth, not an absolute drop. I look back to you know the great financial crisis. If you use that parallel to today, demand would, would fall by 2 million barrels, which sounds like a lot, but I just referenced two uh, headwinds which become tailwinds next year. So the SPR, that was roughly 800 to 900,000 barrels per day. China is half a million. We've got fuel switching in Europe as natural gas remains more expensive, so they're burning uh, oil and diesel in, in lieu of natural uh, gas. And then you've got an EU embargo coming into place in about a month's time where that could finally impact Russian production by a million barrels, give or take. And so the punchline is the fear of a recession on oil demand, I think, is vastly overstated, even if the economy goes into uh, you know, a much, much more profound slowdown than I think most people are, are believing. You've got those other factors to, to negate the, the impact on demand. And then, so if we put all those factors together, how much extra demand could that add to the global oil market? Yeah, so it'd be roughly three and a half to four million barrels per day. You know, S SPR is, was 800, 900,000 barrels per day. Uh, China's at least half a million, that's one and a half. The EU uh, embargo on Russian crude that comes into place, then you've got the products, I think it's in February, that could be a million, you know, give or take. So now we're up to two and a half. And then fuel switching is anywhere from half a million to a million. So you're, you know, you're three, three to three and a half million barrels per day, which is massive because it's, it's not like we're in an, in an oversupplied market, you know, rising inventories and such that like we're, we're profoundly uh, undersupplied as is, you know, I, I put up on Twitter uh, inventory charts in the US and more, more specifically globally, because it's, you've got to take a global perspective. People make this mistake of saying, oh, geez, you know, what, 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 what were inventories 10 years ago? And oh my God, we're close to those levels, which is really stupid because demand's grown so materially to be equally supplied on a market, you need to adjust for the increase in, in demand. So I, I related to a baseline, uh, you take out COVID obviously, because it screws with, with, uh, the data, but prior to that, I'm using like a 16 to 19 baseline. Um, which were material deficit, but even then demand's grown by over 5 million barrels a day since then. So the market's profoundly undersupplied. You've got all of these headwinds uh, or headwinds become tailwinds. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, I find it very tough not to be excited for 2023. And do you see any risks like, for example, if, if Europe decides to switch to coal instead of oil, or if China and India decide to buy Russian barrels after the EU's embargo kicks in? So I, 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 let's say on, on Europe, we've seen virtually no impact on Russian production or meaningfully. So let's say peace breaks out tomorrow, you know, something happens to Putin or whatever, and the, the EU embargo doesn't get into place. Maybe it impacts oil for a day or two, just for, for you know, the, the traders are going to trade. But fundamentally, there's no change to the thesis that the market's undersupplied. We haven't seen the physical impact. So it's not like you've, we've, we've had a loss and, oh my God, we're going to get the barrels back on. Uh, when I think about energy, like I tell clients, that I, there's only four things that I look at. 
you've got demand, so the short, medium, long term. You've got the pace of US shale growth, you've got OPEC, and you've got the global super majors. And everything else beyond that is pretty much noise. And so what we're seeing is, you know, US shale uh, has vastly underperformed this year. A lot of people are looking for a million barrels per day, you know, of growth. We're, we're less than half of that, about half that. I look at 2023, you know, service cost inflation of another 10 to 20 percent means that, you know, you've got eroding returns. You're seeing from Q3 results uh, further evidence that wells are getting worse in the major shale plays, so less productive, gassier, et cetera. Companies adhering to um, the religion of return of capital. And so, you know, I, I think shale will grow, but the era of hyper growth, as I've kind of coined it, is over. OPEC, you know, used to be the biggest call in the world to predict over a year ago, which is, you know, they're going to run out of spare capacity. Then they come out and say that they've run out of spare capacity and they're, they're warning the world. So that was that's an easy call. Now we've got UAE and Saudi adding capacity. It's not coming on until 2025 and 2027. And then the global super majors, we know they're not investing. So it's it's other than a a repeat of COVID, you know, like even if a great financial crisis, which is not, that's not the base case by, by any stretch, there's offsetting factors um, to that. So, you know, I, I think that's the reason why many energy investors are pretty bold up for 2023, because it's kind of a continuation of the major themes of this, of 2022, but it's just getting that much better. Now, oil has already pulled back significantly from June. Do you think most of the recession fears or, or demand destruction is already priced in? And where do you see prices heading from here? So it, like Goldman came out with a report and said, you know, when oil fell from, they said 180, 100 to 80, it was discounting a scenario of, of zero global GDP growth, which again, in a post-war era, so going back a long, long time, other than COVID and other than the, the great financial crisis we've never seen in history. So it's exciting when you can get an opportunity where the price of something discounts the most likely like worst, 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 worst case scenario. So, you know, we're trading barrels at about 90 bucks uh, WTI. I thought we were going to end the year at 100. I've been pretty public with that view. I think it's just like this SPR has been, been muddying the market's ability to see how undersupplied the market uh, is. Maybe people were waiting for Q3 results from shale codes to to see, you know, is discipline going to fade and all that nonsense. It's just people have been hurt so many times they just don't want to be hurt anymore. So they, they just need to see that in uh, in print. So, yeah, I feel decent. Like we're going to, you know, the oil is going to be volatile, but I'm looking for a hundred bucks and exiting uh, this year. And I think that's a pretty good floor, like a fundamental floor to use for the next five to six years. You know, I think we're still in a scenario where oil is going to have to go high enough to kill discretionary demand, which is incredibly difficult. You know, we know during COVID when everybody was locked in their homes, not flying or driving, we were still consuming 92 million barrels every single day. So killing demand is really, really tough. So yeah, ultimately we've, we've got to have oil go high enough to kill demand and, and allow the most eco woke companies on this planet, which are the European super majors to pivot, start investing in, you know, dirty oil again. And then once they do, then it's cycle time. It takes four to six years for them to, to deliver a project. So I think we're in this uh, multi-year bull market for oil based upon um, those factors. And in the context of companies being able to privatize themselves with about five years of, of free cash flow at $100 oil, like it's, it's pretty exciting.